Liberal Viewer presents. So, welcome to the December 26th edition of Liberal Viewer Monday Media Mix-Up. Thanks for joining me. Give me a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you like what I'm doing on my weekly show here, where I'll be showing you the, well, just six best, most newsworthy clips I picked out from the Sunday morning news analysis shows from the big five corporate outlets of ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and Fox News for what should be a really educational, informative, fair use, media criticism, and pl political commentary show for you all today. But actually, there are no ABC clips because, as you see from my title, only CBS, Face the Nation, and Fox News Sunday had uh, news on their Christmas shows yesterday. Uh... NBC News Meet the Press did like the 75th anniversary show and uh, with like who knows when they recorded it and um, I mean probably sometime in the last week but you couldn't really be sure and then uh, CNN State of the Union had this uh, extended documentary look at the first second gentleman the you know uh, Vice President Kamala Harris's husband Doug Emhoff um, and I'll have a clip from both of those shows, but uh, one thing that came up in the clip I'll show you is the last clip where uh, the first second gentleman is also the first Jewish spouse of a president or vice president, and he talks a little bit about anti-Semitism, and during that exchange they mention, oh, this interview was recorded before uh, the Kanye West incident where he, like, got, he lost his contract with adidas and when was that that was like two months ago so cnn was not showing any news um and i'll talk a little bit more about anti-semitism and a video i might make about that uh, after an argument i had a couple weeks ago on one of my live stream videos in the comment section uh, a uh, an argument with one of the recorded show viewers but anyway i do like to start with political comedy and uh, I, I was saying how meet the press had their 75th anniversary special where it was just like a bunch of clips from the history of Meet the Press. And the uh, last set of clips were the, the the fun moments or the funny clips. This is what like Chuck Todd considers political comedy. And uh, so it includes Stephen Colbert, Seth Meyers, Dick Cheney. And uh, then there's a clip at the end with uh, expletive an expletive deleted twice and uh, I'm pretty sure what it is you can tell me in the comment section I don't know exactly why Chuck Todd thinks that uh, when uh, John Boehner at the end of this clip is calling him an expletive it's a backhanded compliment uh, and you can tell me whether you think it's a backhanded compliment and if you think that uh, or what you think the expletive is but it's pretty clear and I will talk about that with you a little more after we watch that meet the press clip from yesterday together over here. Here we go, it's been a lot of fun on this show for years, and we wanted to show you a few of those fun moments. I don't want to be president. I want to run for president, there's a difference. I'm running in South Carolina. You'd like to lose? Mm, I'd like to lose twice. I'd like to lose both a Republican and a Democrat. And what statement would that make? I think that statement would make that I was able to get on the ballot in South Carolina. And if I can do it, so can you. Seth Myers, welcome to Meet the Press. It's great to be here. I'm so excited to be on Meet the Press without having to run for office. <laughs> right. It's so much easier this but way. But if you do want to declare something, you know, feel free to do that. I might. I think mostly I'm just going to run from previous statements <laughs> and uh, hit some talking points. <laughs> I'm watching a lot of Meet the Press to prepare for this. <laughs> Give me your percentage prediction. Carrie Bush Nader. Uh, I think that uh, Kerry's going to get 52 percent. Democrats, 50, in, um, in Bush 52, what? Uh, 47. And one for Nader. One for Nader. 52, All 47, right. one. All right. Mr. Well, Carr. Mr. Russell, everybody knows that I have dyslexia. And what I really meant to say, I just transposed the numbers wrong, <laughs> you know? That's all it was. Oh, I see. You know what I say? <laughs> I got an egg on my oh face. My <laughs> I don't believe this. I got an egg on my oh. face. It was a bad prediction. Should I be relieved you didn't bring your shotgun in today? Uh, I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> You're not in season. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, I hope I never am. 
Before you go, Mr. Secretary, last time you were on one month ago, I received thousands of letters and telegrams about this scene. Let's just watch it Tim, for a second. Tim, don't swing the camera away from me again. <laughs> Finally, Mr. Secretary, in February 2003, you placed your enormous personal credibility before the United Nations and laid out a case against Saddam Hussein, oh. citing... No, they can't use it. They're editing it. It's, they He's still asking me questions. Yeah. He was not Tim, I'm sorry. I lost you. You answered the question. And because of that, we are eternally grateful. We'd like to present you the first annual Colin Powell Palm Tree Award for answering questions under adverse circumstances. <laughs> You'll forever be in the annals of Beat the Press. We thank you again for joining us today. Well, well Tim, thank you very much. Uh, I honor this. Did you ever run for office again? I'd rather set myself on fire than to run for office again. <laughs> you know, the only reason I asked that question, because I expected an answer just like that. Anyway, uh, former... Uh, You're a Oh, well. <laughs> I assume I'm getting that as a compliment. I'll take that as a backhanded compliment. I hate the press. I hate you especially. <laughs> but the fact is, I we need you. We need a free press. To dig into more moments from Meet the Press and our archives, scan the code right here on your screen or visit NBCNews.com slash MTP75. The website is home to 75 of the biggest moments in Meet the Press history. Check them out. See if you agree with our picks. That's all for today. Merry Christmas. Oh, and then right after that, he says, if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press, which of course is a lie. So that's I got to get that in one more time because they often preempt Meet the Press. Well, not often. They sometimes preempt Meet the Press for sporting events and other reasons. Uh, not for Christmas this year, at least apparently, although I don't really get the feeling that Chuck Todd worked on Christmas, even though uh, he is Jewish, so he could have, but... He uh, was not one of the two news shows that was news, but uh, I don't know if you thought all of that was funny. Uh, was that John Boehner insult? Uh, I mean, I believe he called Chuck Todd a shit. I believe that was the word that was uh, deleted out there. But uh, And is that a backhanded compliment or whatever? I, I mean, the one thing I really enjoyed about the 75th anniversary, and you could see it in those clips, was... Um, I enjoyed Tim, seeing Tim Russert. I really miss Tim Russert. He was like one of the greats. And I, I saw, I've been watching these uh, new shows since at least the mid 1980s or even the early 1980s, and including Meet the Press. So uh, I have a, a lot of experience watching the anchors, and Tim Russert was one of the greats. And I kind of missed him on that, but, or, was reminded of how much I miss him. But anyway, you can let me know what you think of uh, what Chuck Todd thinks is fun there in those clips and uh, whatever. There was one other thing I was going to say, but I can't even remember what it was about. Let me see uh, if I can just remind myself real quick of... Uh, the. Oh, yeah, the other thing that I thought was really funny uh, in that one Tim Russert clip with uh, James Carville and Mary Matlin... Uh, when uh, James Carville like got the 2004 election prediction wrong and came back on and like broke that egg on his forehead, what I found found really surprising about that is if you watch it, I think it looked like Mary Matlin was surprised. So I always thought that they, you know, they had that like uh, Democrat versus Republican uh, 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 marriage going that was like the the conflict marriage that worked well in the media that, that was like before Kellyanne Conway and George Conway had their like uh, old establishment Republican George Conway versus uh, Trump Republican Kellyanne Conway and then George Conway became a never Trumper and so they were kind of like the prototype for that maybe although I guess the Conways are all on the right side but uh, it looked like Mary Madeline was uh, was genuinely surprised when James Carville like broke that egg on his forehead and uh, so maybe they didn't script it all out beforehand anyway I just, that was one other thing I wanted to point about point out about that clip and uh, then the next two clips are the only news summaries uh, and I'm gonna do the shortest one first because it's almost kind of like a joke is this even a news summary face the nation I mean they did real news they, Margaret Brennan showed up there on Christmas morning it seemed pretty clear and they discussed the news and they had some uh, like they did some news on Ukraine and some other stuff later but the, her brief intro before getting to the first uh, guest uh, representative Jamie Raskin uh, I mean pretty much just saying like happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, and 
you know, 2022 is coming to an end and many issues will continue into 2023. That's kind of the new summary. Is that even a new summary? You can let me know what you think after we watch that brief new summary together over here. Good morning and welcome to Face the Nation. We wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. Thank you for joining us this holiday Sunday. The clock is still ticking on the final days of 2022, but there's a lot that's going to carry over to 2023. Today, we want to take a look at some of those stories. We're joined now by Maryland Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin, a member of the committee investigating the January 6th attack. And I will have a clip from that uh, Representative Jamie Raskin interview. Uh, the whole thing, if you go down in the link in the video description, uh, you know, by the way, I played that NBC News Meet the Press clip all the way to where he told you where you could find all the 75 best moments from 75 years of Meet the Press. And I've also put a link down in the video description to the Meet the Press uh, and, well, to the source of all my videos. And uh, down there is CBS News Face the Nation actually goes to their YouTube channel where it's all split up into segments. Uh, and you can watch pretty much the whole program. Uh, and the whole Jamie Raskin interview, and I'm going to have like a five and a half minute Jamie Raskin clip. Uh, oh, I also have down in the video description short summaries of all my clips. And uh, if I look at those short summaries, I see that the Jamie Raskin clip is clip number five. Uh, that will be coming up, but uh, I have to show you clip three and four before that. Uh, and this is actually the Fox News bias segment of the program. Uh, you, my longtime viewers remember me for my Fox News bias videos. For many years, I made over 200 Fox News bias videos uh, documenting all the ways that they uh, were biased beyond, you know, the regular media. Uh, the rest of the media has like a bunch of biases towards corporatism, towards sensationalism, towards oversimplification, both sideism, uh, there are various other biases I've talked about over the years, but Fox News, of course, isn't even a news organization. It was created to be a propaganda outlet for the Republican Party, as uh, by Roger Ailes, as detailed in the book The Loudest Voice in the Room by Gabriel Sherman, you could read. And uh, that is like a historical perspective on how Fox News is not a news organization, in addition to all the evidence I compiled over the years. But uh, I'm going to show some Fox News bias in the, the way they had their panel discussion right after this new summary. And I'm going to show both of the uh, news reporters talking to Shannon Bream, uh, both Charles Watson, who I see like every day in the, the Atlanta airport reporting on like travel problems during you know, the Christmas travel season. And I don't know, that's more, that's not political bias. That's more like the sensationalism, the media over, like overhyped storms. Was this storm really that a, a big deal that it should be like the first report on Fox News? And then Aisha Hosni does kind of a biased Republican view on uh, the omnibus spending bill that I talked about briefly last week. And anyway, after we watch all of that bias, uh, in what was like the only real news report for the week, I will talk about the bias in their panel discussions afterwards and even show a couple of the bias panel discussions. Uh, and there's actually some talk about Trump's troubles with the January 6th committee criminal referrals and the release of his taxes, but they leave out some important details at the end of this news summary I will talk about with you a little more after we watch it together over here. Merry Christmas from Fox News in Washington. Millions of Americans are waking up to a deep freeze after a powerful winter storm left hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses without power, snarled holiday traffic, and left at least 18 dead. For many, it's the coldest Christmas in more than 30 years. Meanwhile, lawmakers approved a massive $1.7 trillion funding package, avoiding the brewing storm and a government shutdown just days before the holiday. We begin today with team coverage. Aisha Hosni is live in Washington with more on the last minute funding agreement. But first, to Charles Watson, live from Atlanta's Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, where travelers are still dealing with delays at the world's busiest airport. Charles. 
Hey, good morning, Shannon. After tens of thousands of cancellations, there are a lot of folks here in Atlanta and across the country who won't be able to stay home for the holidays this Christmas. Thousands are still facing delays and cancellations as the Arctic blast puts 60 percent of the nation's population under some kind of winter advisory or warning over the last few days. And while there are still thousands of airport disruptions impacting travelers, things are improving. The latest numbers from FlightAware show there are more than 1,200 delays and 1,300 cancellations so far, less than yesterday, a sign that perhaps the worst is behind us. But in an Arctic freeze, the airlines have their work cut out for them. Here in Atlanta, the cold weather snapped pipes flooding a Delta lounge in the international terminal. In Buffalo, officials say the airport will be closed through Monday after whipping snow made it too dangerous to go anywhere. Despite a shaky travel outlook across the country, most travelers seem to be keeping their cool. I've been traveling to New York since yesterday. So <laughs> I've been I've been on a cancel flight yesterday and a cancel flight today. I'm just trying to get my bags now. They saying they can't they can't get my bags to me. It's going to take five hours for me to get my bags. I just I just checked in yesterday. So <laughs> I'm just at a loss right now. And it hasn't been any easier on the roads. Officials report more than a dozen deaths related to the storm, eight of them due to car accidents, including at least four in this multi-car crash in Ohio in whiteout conditions. And the ice and the snow could be a lingering issue for drivers as AAA expects the roads to get busy again on Tuesday and Wednesday. Shannon? Charles Watson reporting from Atlanta. Charles, thank you so much. Joining us now in Washington, Aisha Hasni on Ukraine's new pleas for billions in financial assistance just as Congress reaches its own federal funding agreement before that midnight deadline. Aisha. Good morning to you, Shannon, and Merry Christmas. In a last-minute dash Friday, Congress approved that massive $1.7 trillion government funding bill, also known as the Omnibus, but it will take days for it to reach the president's desk, which is why President Biden, in fact, signed a stopgap bill to keep the government funded through December 30th. Now, Republicans are deeply divided over this Omnibus. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell persuaded 18 Republicans to help Democrats pass it, applauding the the $800 billion in defense funding, but others say the bill has a lot of pork and they are slamming a and slamming a giant budget right before Christmas, they say, shows just how broken Congress really is. This is a monstrosity that is one of the most shameful acts I've ever seen in this body. Now, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy is already threatening to kill bills sponsored by Senate Republicans who voted for the omnibus if he becomes speaker next year. He doesn't quite yet have the votes. Meantime, the omnibus also includes $45 billion in additional Ukraine aid, which comes just days after a historic visit from Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. While a vast majority of Democrats and Republicans do support more Ukraine aid, a growing number of Republicans say they want more details about how that money is being spent. Meanwhile, a bad week for former President Trump. Democrats not only released his tax returns, which showed he paid little to no federal income taxes between 2015 and 2022, but also the January 6th committee recommended that he be criminally prosecuted by the DOJ, blaming the former president for the Capitol riot. In its final report, the committee accused the former president of committing conspiracy to defraud the federal government and inciting an insurrection. And Shannon Trump denounced this report, writing on his Truth Social media account, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger, he said. Ultimately, though, it will be up to the DOJ to pursue charges or not. Shannon. Yeah, we await their decision. Aisha Hasni, thank you so much for reporting in Washington for us this morning. It is time now for our Sunday group. co -anchor <laughs> and I'll talk about the bias in the Sunday group there uh, in a minute. But uh, I don't know exactly why the top story was the weather, you know, like snow in winter is the top story. That is, But that's not political bias. That's kind of like a like sensationalism that you see in all the media. And that and there's Fox News has kind of this corporate bias that uh, a lot of the media has. I, I mean, it is kind of right wing bias in a way, but it's right wing corporate bias when you saw in Asia. Aisha Hosni's report, she talked about how, you know, Republicans were glad about the $800 billion in defense spending, but they weren't so happy about the, a lot of pork being in the bill. Like, oh, 
the $800 billion worth of, of defense spending doesn't include any pork. That is like a total false dichotomy there. But uh, you see that on a lot of the corporate media where they like, because a lot of them, uh, in the, you know, they're, they have a lot of defense contractor advertisers and, you know, they are, uh, you know, they're all like huge corporations. So they want like government spending on these, you know, 800 billion. That's not over 10 years. Remember they were, they were talking about all the, the Biden, like the build back better bill. And they would talk about how, how it was like over, you know, two, three, you know, however many trillion dollars, but that was over 10 years. This is $800 billion for defense in one year, one year. Why don't they talk about that over 10 years? Because $800 billion in one year, that's what, uh, $8 trillion over 10 years. That was like bigger than any of those, uh, like social spending bills that, uh, were like, so anathema to Republicans and Fox News and, I don't know why uh, the uh, $800 billion in one year for defense doesn't get the same coverage. But uh, the other thing I thought was a little disingenuous was the way they covered the Republican uh, split on Ukraine. They said, you know, there's growing uh, a growing number of Republicans who just want to know how it's being spent. You know, they just want to be like good fiscal stewards of our money. Like Republicans have ever been been uh, good fiscal stewards of our money. No, there's actually kind of like a Putin wing of the Republican Party where some of them like have uh, have insulted Vladimir Zelensky over the years, and there were even a few in Congress who refused to like stand up for all the standing ovations, like Matt Gates and uh, uh, what's the other guy's name? I can't remember, but. There are several, I mean, some Republicans didn't even go, but uh, there were some that, like, refused to stand for the standing ovations because they just had to be, you know, the, like I said, the Putin wing of the Republican Party. And then uh, there was some reporting, like I said, uh, before I showed the clip at the end about Trump's troubles with the January 6th committee, where uh, H.R. Hosny mentioned two of the four criminal referral charges, uh, and also mentioned how like Trump paid little to no income taxes over uh, the six years that uh, we got summaries of his tax returns finally this week. But two things that I didn't hear at all about. First, he lost a huge amount of money most of the years, but, and then he started making money when he was president. Uh, and that's one of the reasons he didn't pay taxes. But the other thing that like no one ever talked about on Fox News that was big news like on all the rest of the corporate media that covered the release of Trump's tax returns is don't people remember why he didn't release his tax returns during the election because he was under audit uh, you know it's uh, you know he, as soon as the audit is over he's gonna release his taxes he kept saying that over and over again well it turns out he wasn't under audit they didn't even audit his taxes till 2019 and even though uh, the IRS has a regulation that says they're supposed to audit the uh, current president's taxes every year. And somehow he like suppressed the audit all the way to his third year as president. And you notice that didn't get reported at all on Fox News. And I'll, I'll show a, uh, I'm going to, the next clip I'm going to show is a, a part of the all right wing panel on Fox News Sunday discussing both Trump's tax returns and the January 6th committee, but in a way that totally downplays uh, what actually happened. And first, you saw that Shannon Bream was introducing the panel there. Uh, where's the, like, liberal on this panel? Who's, like, representing even views of Democrats in any way? Because uh, the panel is uh, Dana Perino, uh, who is a co-anchor of America's Newsroom, but used to be the press secretary for George W. Bush, so sort of an establishment Republican. And then there's this dude, David Avella, who's GOPAC chairman, so he's like head of, he's like actually a Republican Party official running their political action committee. And then they have their like media critic, Howard Kurtz, who is like head of media criticism on Fox News, which is like the most biased network, but is always looking outward, trying to find bias in like other media outlets. So is none of them are liberals. Uh, 
uh, none. It's like an all right wing panel, and so you can see uh, that's one criticism I have of the Fox News Sunday coverage in their panel discussions. And then in the first segment, when they discussed the news, all of the prompts came from right wing sources, like uh, three quarters of them from like Fox News affiliated uh, organizations. They discussed several topics. Uh, well, you know, it used to be when on Fox News, when they uh, mentioned the Wall Street Journal, they would always say, oh, owned by our parent corporation, uh, News Corp or, you know, and it's, you know, that's the Wall Street Journal is also owned by Rupert Murdoch and the Fox and the and News Corp. And uh, that was two of the four prompts for discussion in the panel discussion that followed the Fox News Sunday news summary. The first prompt here, you can see Kimberly Strassel talking about the omnibus bill from Wall Street Journal opinion page. Uh, the, and I'm not going to show that discussion. And then the second prompt for the discussion uh, was something Kevin McCarthy said about taking a hard line against senators who back this omnibus spending bill, which, remember, is just to keep the government funded. That's what, you know, they're supposed to be all these uh, uh, 12 different budget bills that they pass in October, but Congresses haven't done that for years, so they cram it all together in this omnibus bill. And uh, actually, uh, that's something Dana Prito at least pointed out in the panel discussion I'm not going to show. Uh, but the two last topics that they talked about, I am going to show you the panel discussion. Uh, the first prompt on that was from Andrew McCarthy, who's like Fox News legal analyst. I've made a video about him in the past about how he's a total hack when it comes to legal analysis. Well, it was it's he was talking about the January 6th committee final report. Uh, the panel makes it harder because it gives Trump the defense that it's politicized since this so-called political uh, committee is where the evidence is coming from. One thing they never mention on Fox News is that almost all the witnesses were Republicans appointed by Trump. Like maybe it was, uh, and you'll see Howard Kurtz in the beginning of the, or in this next clip, but uh, then you'll see the other prompt here for Dana Perino is talking about Trump's tax returns. And they, the thing that they cover most on Fox News about that is the so-called breaking of norms where the committee has voted to release someone's tax returns. And Dana Perino talks about that, and but mentions, of course, how Trump broke the norm of people running for president releasing their tax returns. But, of course, they never mention what I talked about, how he like lied about being under audit for years as his bogus excuse for not releasing his tax returns but anyway i think i have like pre-criticized this next clip in terms of the all right-wing panel and the all right-wing prompts mostly from fox affiliated uh, there's the kevin mccarthy prompt but it's i mean andrew mccarthy also has the last name mccarthy and he's a fox news legal analyst so does that uh, no i guess there's no mccarthy linkage there but and then two wall street journal prompts and Anyway, uh, I'm going to show you the last two uh, uh, pieces of discussion here. Shannon Bream prompting uh, Howard Kurtz and Dana Perino to talk about the January 6th committee and uh, Trump's tax returns, which I think I've spent way too long pre-criticizing, but I'll talk about with you a little more after we watch that clip together over here. Okay, let's go to National Review Online, talking about another big story this week, the January 6th committee wrapping up, releasing its report, recommending these criminal referrals for the former president. Andy McCarthy, Andy McCarthy writing over there at National Review says this, a criminal prosecution would be difficult, and the panel makes it harder still by giving Trump the defense that a politicized, Democrat-dominated committee pressured the Biden Justice Department to indict Biden's potential opponent in the 2024 election. Howie, the media spent a lot of time on these hearings and on this story this week. Does it in some way work to the former president's political advantage in the end? Um, sure, because the last thing that the Justice Department wants is to appear to be working in concert with a committee that, let's face it, you know, uh, it was totally anti-Trump, all Democrats and two anti-Trump Republicans. You know, this final session reminded me of a bunch of aging rockers stumbling their way onto the stage and playing a medley of their greatest hits. They literally just played snippets of past testimony, so there wasn't much new there. And this criminal referrals of Donald Trump, um, you know, was largely symbolic. The Justice Department is investigating Donald Trump on all 
sorts of things from the top secret documents to January 6th and on and on and on. It really didn't need this act, but what it did was it got a tsunami of coverage, as you mentioned, and it put... Um, it, it, it enabled the committee to remind everybody what had happened, but I'm not sure uh, it was good, except that Adam Schiff got to be on TV about 112 times. Well, something else that's getting a lot of Democrats on TV is the talk of releasing the former president's tax returns. There's been a legal fight brewing over this for years ongoing. They take a committee vote this week, House Ways and Means, vote on party lines that they're going to release them. Wall Street Journal uh, opinion has this warning. It says, Democrats have spent years trying to justify any action to get Mr. Trump, and releasing his tax returns is another wrecking ball to standards and norms. Democrats could come to regret it, and sooner than they think. Um, Dana, what about that possibility that this committee under Republican leadership could also go after some other people's tax returns and make them public from the other sure. side of the aisle? I mean, it, it's like the filibuster, right? Um, that's always like the game of chicken, and this is unprecedented. And I think that the committee was probably, or Democrats overall, were probably disappointed uh, in the report that they got after they had Trump's tax returns, and now they want to just release them to the public. But they failed to get the headlines that they wanted. And one of the biggest headlines, though, Shannon, was that the IRS didn't have enough manpower to audit President Trump's taxes. So you're telling us that the IRS actually needs more IRS agents, in addition to the ones that you just passed in the previous bill that Biden wanted, in order to talk about um, the, pres the former president's tax returns. Now, however, tax returns can be released on, on the people the people who are running for office have usually done that i understand that was a breaking of norms but this would also be a breaking of norms and i don't know if you're going to have future presidents who refuse to release their taxes so I, in a way i think they should tap the brakes slow their roll and allow for the next presidential campaign to happen and then if the congress thinks that there has to be some requirement then they can try to pass a law that does that yeah, and uh, it feels like we are very much already into that next presidential election. <laughs> so, yeah, I pretty much pre-criticized that clip and talked about a lot of things that were biased about it. But a, a couple things I forgot to mention that I noticed when we were just watching it together. Uh, first, when Howard Kurtz was trying to downplay what the January 6th committee did in their last hearing, and he didn't even talk about the report they put out, uh, but uh, he... There was one thing he said with they literally just paid just played snippets of their past hearings, which that is the word literally means that's all they did, which is not true. If you watched my show last week, which I waited till after the hearing to to do, I, I mentioned how they sh there was new evidence. There was the uh, Kellyanne Conway interview that was new. Uh, there was uh, I can't remember. There was one other person with additional information and they had a whole bunch of new texts that they showed the the Mark Meadows texts and like uh so there was actually new information that came out at the final meeting of the January 6th committee and then they uh released their final report and they released the transcripts of all the interviews which uh were really revealing so uh that's one more thing that Howard Kurt said that was totally inaccurate that they, he said they literally just played snippets of past hearings, which literally is not true. And then I talked about uh, Dana Perino talking about the breaking of norms, but then at least admitting that Trump broke the norm of presidential candidates releasing their taxes, but she didn't talk about how he uh, justified it with a lie that he was under audit and... Uh, they didn't really uh, talk about the other thing that was revealed uh, that I talked about earlier about how the IRS has this regulation that they're supposed to audit the president's taxes every year that the president is in office and they didn't do it for Trump till 2019 and then when they did finally do it they assigned like one guy to audit his taxes even though it was like this huge complicated uh thing that was put together by like highly paid accountants and lawyers and I mean that's the thing that you know the one of the thing Republican talking points about uh, the last bill that was passed uh, 
included uh, like 87,000 new IRS agents and their talking point on that is well you know rich people have accountants and lawyers to get around that and so they must be pointed at the poor people but no the the point is that if rich people have accountants and lawyers we need like accountants and lawyers at the IRS though those are like the 87,000 people they're hiring and the like big example of that is the thing Dana Prino got wrong. She says, well, like the IRS only gave one person there and they, now they're trying to like her point didn't even make sense because the real conclusion of what happened with Donald Trump's taxes is we do need to hire more IRS agents and give the IRS more power to go after the rich who have all the accountants and lawyers to avoid paying taxes. The only way to overcome that, tax evasion is with uh, government manpower or person power to uh, counteract it. So that is one more point I wanted to make about that clip. And, you know, uh, Howard Kurtz really downplayed what came out of the January 6th committee hearing. And so I want to show this clip of Jamie Raskin over on CBS News's Face the Nation that I promised earlier. And I saw uh, one of my... Uh, most uh, loyal viewers uh, about eight minutes ago here, uh, Seal Beater uh, at 403 in the live comment saying, imagine referring to the criminal process a president exercising his freedom of speech. His freedom of speech. They're trying to prosecute Donald Trump for exercising his freedom of speech on January 6th. And uh, I dealt with this extensively in my live stream last week where I actually agree with the idea that if we were prosecuting Donald Trump for his speech on the whatever the ellipse or wherever he gave that speech on January 6th that like the stop the steal speech where he said let's march on the Capitol but also said you know do it peaceably or whatever if we were just prosecuting him for making that speech on January 6th I would actually agree with Seal Beater's comment that we were criminally referring a president for freedom of speech. You know, that doesn't really, you know, there the Brandenburg standard is that uh, if you want to prosecute someone for speech, it has to be, uh, has to be uh, intended to uh, incite imminent lawless action, you know, intended to incite imminent lawless action and uh, likely to result in that lawless action. So those are like the two things. It, you have to mean to make this lawless action about to happen. And you also, it all that lawless action has to be likely to result from your speech. That's the only way you get over the Brandenburg standard where you're inciting violence. And uh, I don't think the speech on the ellipse meets that standard. I think maybe Donald Trump's tweet about... Uh, Mike Pence doesn't have the courage when he knew that there were like people at the Capitol uh, who were like chanting hang Mike Pence and Cassidy Hutchinson talked about how uh, Mark Meadows said he doesn't care he thinks Mike Pence deserves it that you know that speech that tweet the like Mike Pence doesn't have the courage tweet when they were already chanting hang Mike Pence that seems more uh intended to incite imminent lawless action and likely to uh, result in lawless action in meeting the Brandenburg standard. But uh, it's not only just the Brandenburg standard and uh, what Trump did to incite the rioters. He engaged in a lot of other behavior that, uh, like over months leading up to January 6th, that is a conspiracy to defraud the United States. Uh, to come up with the slate of fake electors and, uh, you know, the plotting of a coup to pressure uh, Mike Pence to not certify the results and uh, uh, stop the, you know, fair and accurate results of the 2020 election being certified by the Congress. That's, you know, a obstruction of an, an official proceeding under 18 USC 1512 sub C that's a whole other thing and anyway uh, this is all a lead into uh, representative Jamie Raskin kind of responding to that Fox News bias about how they're politicizing it 
by uh, doing the criminal referrals and also talking about how it's a coup. You know, Margaret Brennan says it's like the facts are muddy that he that it's a coup, but uh, Representative Jamie Raskin uh, really corrects her, and uh, I think uh, he does a good job of uh, cleansing our palate from the Fox News bias you saw in the previous clip. And also from that comment from Seal Beater that I think I kind of refuted, uh, I'll start reading your live comments again after we watch start watching Jamie Raskin together from CBS News's Face the Nation yesterday over here. Let's get back to the, the work that you have just concluded, because you did make this historic decision to refer to the Justice Department for potential prosecution. A former president of the United States has never been done before, but in doing so, it doesn't have the requirement that the Justice Department act. Why did you think making that referral was necessary? Why not just let your work stand on its own with the public hearings? Well, because of the magnitude of the attack on democracy. You know, we don't have a formal statutory offense called crimes against democracy, but that's what everything was together. And then there were hundreds of actual statutory offenses under that. And we identified four. There was a deliberate attempt by Donald Trump to interfere and obstruct and impede a federal proceeding. That was the whole plan. Stop the steal, meaning go in there and blockade the House and the Senate and the vice president from doing their job. It was an attempt to defraud the United States. There was a conspiracy to defraud the United States to exchange an honest to goodness presidential election for a counterfeit election complete with fake electors and forcible violence being used to overthrow uh, the process. It involved the introduction of false statements, these mm -hmm. fake electors that were put in. And finally, there was aiding and abetting an insurrection, giving aid and comfort to insurrectionists. Um, that's an old crime in America. Our Constitution yeah. repeatedly opposes insurrection and condemns it. And, of course, we thought we had solved that problem in the Civil War. But that statute that we refer to there was passed after the Civil War to make sure that people who incite insurrection mm -hmm. and aid and abet it and give aid and comfort to the insurrectionists by saying things like, I love you, you're very special, those people are guilty of an offense against the United States, even if you're president when you do it. But don't you fear in some ways, because this referral you're making doesn't have the weight of prosecution behind it. That has to be up to the Justice Department to decide to move forward. And that's a good thing, too. But do you fear that because it is a political body making this recommendation, that it makes it easier for people to brush away some of what you just laid out, that it makes it easier to characterize it or mm. dismiss it as political in nature? Look, in a democracy, the people have the right to the truth. Um, and so our bipartisan panel with overwhelmingly Republican witnesses coming to testify has laid out the truth, the best that we could find it. It's not been contradicted or undermined in any way that I'm aware of. And we're turning it over to the people and we're turning it over to the mm -hmm. Department of Justice. And at that point, your, your point is correct. It's up to them and it should operate like that. It, Congress doesn't prosecute. But like everybody else, if we're aware of offenses, we've got to turn that evidence over to people who are prosecutors. And you're in that process now of sharing with the Justice Department some of what you found. The Department of Justice has a far vaster panoply of investigative resources available to them than we do. And a higher benchmark they have to meet to actually move ahead and prosecute. So, you know, one of the things I've heard people often parse the language coup, attempted coup. And they, those skeptics that you referred to earlier would argue that to substantiate a coup, you need to actually prove that the president was cooking up this plan, directing people to do things, and that he had the support of the military in there. Whereas some of what has been laid out is kind of this unwieldy, muddy plan. How do you actually you know, assert that it was almost democracy that was lost at that moment. Well, in our report, we lay out every element of the plan, including going to the legislatures to try to get them to nullify the popular vote mm -hmm. and pass new statutes that would just appoint Trump's electors uh, that failed. 
we uh, lay out his plan of going to election officials like Raffensperger in Georgia, but he wasn't the only one. There were more than a dozen cases like that and trying to get them just to concoct votes. Just find me 11,780 votes. That wasn't Donald Trump trying to stop election fraud. That was Donald Trump trying to commit election fraud and a conspiracy to perpetrate it right there. So we lay it out. It's not muddy at all. It's mm -hmm. very clear. This is really about the future because the political scientists and the historians tell us that the best sign of a successful coup coming is a recently failed coup where the coup plotters get to diagram the weaknesses in the existing structure, and they're emboldened if they're not held accountable for what they did. I know Mike Pence said that it would be divisive uh, for the government to prosecute the case. That's not the test for whether or not prosecutors prosecute a case. The test is whether there was a crime committed. It's the facts and the law. I mean, you could just as well say it will be divisive not to hold mm -hmm. a president accountable who's guilty for offenses. But in any event, it's not part of the calculus. Huh. So, yeah, that was a great clip from Representative Jamie Raskin. And uh, I think he laid out there the various crimes that uh, the January 6th committee found evidence that Donald Trump committed and why it's important uh, for him to be held accountable. That whole that last part about political scientists say that one of the uh, warning signs of a successful coup is an unsuccessful coup where the coup plotters have a ability to like find the weaknesses and aren't held accountable. And I don't know, it reminds me of like the beer hall pooch, you know, uh, uh, Hitler and the 1920s and then he like got put in jail and wrote Mein Kampf and then came out like stronger and more able to like blend into the political system and then subvert it from uh, whatever I don't know it, <laughs> have I like uh, made an analogy to the Nazis that I shouldn't have but I, I don't know if that's what Jamie Raskin is talking about because he's like a Jew on cable on Christmas uh, talking about maybe the Nazis, you can, uh, I don't know what, but uh, I also thought that Jamie Raskin did a great job of explaining how, you know, refuting what I was discussing before the clip in terms of uh, seal beaters claim that this is punishing Donald Trump for his free speech, but, you know, what about the conspiracy to defraud the government with the whole fake elector scheme? Uh, uh, what about pressuring various uh, state officials to uh, not certify the accurate voting totals. Uh, you know, we heard the thing in Georgia, but Georgia wasn't the only place where I just want to find 11,780 votes or whatever. I mean, uh, there's that whole thing. There's the pressuring of Mike Pence to uh, subvert the Constitution with the idea that the vice president gets to choose who's going to be president like that isn't totally bogus and made up and uh, a violation of the law and uh, anyway uh, I talked about it uh, somewhat before Jamie Raskin made his points and Jamie Raskin made the argument better than I can make it and uh, I mean I may maybe made a few different points but uh, that was uh, the penultimate news clip I want to show you the uh, final news clip for my final live stream of 2022 I, I will be back next week uh, on Monday January 2nd right isn't it Monday January 2nd isn't that when I'm gonna be back next week uh, hold on yeah that's right Monday January 2nd I will be doing the first show of 2023 uh, based on whatever the news programs decide to do on New Year's Day. I don't know who's going to be preempted and who's going to be pre-recorded. It'll probably be kind of a light show like this week, but they uh, they were all panel discussion or mostly panel discussions this week and next week and whatever. I'll try to make a show out of it like I do every week. I hope you appreciate the time and effort I put into this live stream every week. It takes like... Ooh, like 10 hours of work and usually gets demonetized for most of my views and 
So I'm just looking for support through Super Chat contributions and through my monthly uh, supporters on Patreon and under the video that, uh, in the top of the video description you can become a monthly patron on Patreon or give a one-time PayPal contribution or there's a join button down there and you can become a YouTube member and so those are various ways to keep supporting this live stream because uh, as I've discussed uh, over the last few weeks I'm going to keep doing this for two more years all the way through 2024 all the way through the next presidential election I'm going to keep doing this Monday media mix-up uh, sometime on Monday somewhere between like 2 and 6 p.m. Pacific time on Mondays depending on what types of other meetings I have I have all sorts of like other commitments and I'll work them out through the years and I don't know maybe some weeks I might even skip a week I, that might be something new I will do like next May possibly but anyway that's the most of an update I want to give you on all that but I do have one more clip I want to show you and it has to do with a, a video I have been thinking of making about uh, Kanye West and Dave Chappelle and even Jon Stewart talking about uh, the rise in anti-Semitism. You know, uh, Kanye West, or I guess he's now known as Ye or Ye or whatever. He like made all these anti-Semitic statements a couple months ago. Uh, and uh, he, he lost like a billion dollars in his whole uh, Adidas thing, the Yeezy or whatever it was. I never bought any of that. But uh, the... And then uh, Dave Chappelle did hit this monologue right after the midterm elections on Saturday Night Live where he made several kind of borderline anti-Semitic statements. Uh, I talked about that two weeks ago on my, I, my live Monday Media Mix-Up live stream where I talked about Elon Musk and Kirsten Cinema there in the thumbnail for the video two weeks ago. But I also talked about Dave Chappelle uh, because the day before Dave Chappelle had been in San Francisco and brought Elon Musk up on stage with him and then two weeks ago I went to see Dave Chappelle here in Sacramento I saw his stand-up routine I, I've been a long time Dave Chappelle fan but uh, going back to like seeing him in a small club in St. Louis in like 1996 maybe or seven I, I'm not I have to go find those ticket stubs but I will go find those ticket stubs and show them in this video I'm thinking of making about anti-Semitism and Kanye West and Dave Chappelle and then Jon Stewart went on the Late Show with uh, Stephen Colbert and kind of defended uh, what Dave Chappelle said in support of Kanye West but I actually thought a lot of the things Dave Chappelle said were borderline anti-Semitic and if you go to the comment section of my video two weeks ago I got into this uh, I got into this argument with someone in the recorded show comments. I can't even remember the person's name. Okay, I'm going to go and look at it. Oh, here it is. Elon Musk, Kirsten Cinema. It's taking forever. Oh, Elon Musk. Oh, Elon Musk, Kirsten Cinema, move more toward right-wing Republicans. LV Monday Media Mix-Up 80. That's the my uh, video from two weeks ago. And down in the comments section, I got into this... Uh, oh, his name is Bless the Beast. I think it's a him. I, I guess I'm... Uh, Bless the Beast... Uh, I got into an argument about whether what Dave Chappelle said was racist. And I said, well, it was borderline racist because he was saying, like, the Jews control Hollywood. And then Bless the Beast was like, well, that's not racist or that's not anti-Semitic. Uh, that's, uh, that's true. And then I had to, like, explain to someone in my comment section about how, like, no, it's actually anti-Semitic to claim that the Jews control Hollywood. That's not true at all and uh, it made me think maybe I should make this video and uh, this is 
uh, right before the last newsmaker clip. So if you're watching the video all the way to this point, where how far are we in at this point? We're like 53 minutes in. If you're still watching, I know you're a really loyal viewer. So uh, I I would really appreciate uh, your comments about should I spend the time and effort making a video about Kanye West, Dave Chappelle, John Stewart, and anti-Semitism. I kind of like did some of the research already talking, uh, like trying to uh, refute what that person was saying in my video a couple weeks ago in the comment section. So uh, I have some extra time this week. Maybe I can make like an edited produced video, like, uh, like whether Dave... Dave Chappelle, anti-Semitic, John Stewart defending, or, I don't know, some video title about anti-Semitism that has Dave Chappelle and John Stewart in the title. The thing is, if I make a video that has, like, anti-Semitism as a subject or in the title, or it's probably not going to be monetized. That's one of the reasons I haven't done it so far. But uh, anyway... Uh, I've been thinking about that and uh, thinking about the rise in anti-Semitism. And so I kind of appreciated CNN's State of the Union for talking to Doug Emhoff, the first second gentleman about that in this final newsmaker clip. Although I am uh, kind of uh, critical of what CNN did showing this interview, like how old is this? This isn't even news. I talked about this at the beginning of the program. This interview was recorded before the Kanye West statement. Uh, they kind of admit that, but they're like playing it as news on Christmas Day just so they don't have to work that. I mean, I mean, that's not like anti-Semitic, but it's like totally uh, subservient to Christianity, I guess. I, I mean, maybe I only see that because I'm ethnically Jewish and I have this perspective on anti-Semitism. You know, I'm I'm not Jewish religiously because I'm an agnostic atheist, but uh, I'm definitely ethnically Jewish and I could talk about that more. And if I made this video, you can let me know what you think. I'm going to check the live comments and then when this is a recorded video, I'll look to see if my loyal viewers who watched all the way to the like 56 minute point, if you're a loyal viewer, a, a recorded show viewer, also let me know what you think all the way here at the end, whether I should make this video about Kanye West, Dave Chappelle, and Jon Stewart's comments on anti-Semitism while we watch this final newsmaker clip, or is it a newsmaker? I mean, Doug Emhoff is a newsmaker, but it's an interview from like two months ago over here. Even more so, he says, right now, as anti-Semitism is on the rise in America. Anti-Semitism is everywhere right now. It's, it's literally out in the open. People aren't hiding it. They're saying the quiet parts, not out loud, they're screaming the quiet parts right now. I could say anti-Semitic things and Adidas can't drop me. Now what? We spoke just before Kanye West's grotesque rants denigrating Jews spread like wildfire, spurring events like this, an anti-Semitic banner unfurled off a bridge over the 405, a major highway in Los Angeles, Emhoff's adopted hometown. He released a statement saying, quote, we must all stand united and speak out against anti-Semitism. No person of any faith should have to fear violence because of what they believe. Have you been the victim of anti-Semitism? It's, it's interesting. I've, I have been, it, been around it when people don't realize I'm Jewish. Mm. And a lot of times in the business, uh, in my business career, I'll be in a room and people are having their drinks and talking and someone will make an anti-Semitic remark, not realizing that I'm Jewish. What do you do? And sometimes I would say something, you know, sometimes I, sh I should have and I didn't, depending on the circumstance. And I look back now and I, I'm mad mm -hmm. still. And I wish I, there's a few moments that I wish I would have said something, mm -hmm. but you're young, you're in the business yeah. world and you just don't know how to react. And, you know, the, the, that's why I'm always going to speak out and live the way I'm living right now. Up next, the second gentleman on the road. <laughs> 
So yeah, that's the last newsmaker clip, and you can let me know what you think about uh, whether I should make that video about anti-Semitism. I, I appreciate all of you who uh, showed up for the live show, even though this is, I guess, kind of a holiday, or I guess in the UK it's Boxing Day, but this is like Christmas Day celebrated, or this is like the federal holiday in the United States this year because Christmas was on a Sunday, which may be why there were so few uh so little news coverage from the cable news network the big five corporate outlets only fox news and cbs really had news uh abc didn't even have the show and as you saw nbc and uh nbc and cnn had like not really news coverage it was 75th anniversary for nbc and then in that clip you saw that that doug emhoff interview took place months ago but uh, i guess it was kind of still newsworthy and i uh, i mean it was interesting to watch and you can see it down at the link in the video description i put all my sources as usual uh summaries of all my clips and anyway thank you all for joining me uh, this is my last show of 2022. I've been looking back on 2022, and uh, I was just thinking, especially I can share with you, my regular viewers, that <laughs> the thing about 2022 that really sucked was my cat Dash and my dog Sandy both died this year. You know, just a couple days ago, December 23rd, I got this, like, Facebook memory reminder that, Ten years ago, this uh, December 23rd, this year is when we got Sandy. And I saw like a picture of Sandy from uh, 2012, uh, December 23rd, 2012, when we first adopted her as a rescue. They said she was like two or three years old at that time. And uh, she might have been a little older. And anyway, we didn't even get a decade of Sandy and... I've been looking at old Dash pictures, and <sighs> anyway, there there may be a new kitten in the future, certainly during the next two years, probably in the next few months. It's just a question, as I've mentioned many times, of replacing the flooring that has been destroyed by our pets, and like we've got to get rid of all the old urine smells, so any new cat we get won't pee where the old cat peed. We need like Hopefully this new cat will pee in the litter box because Dash got, Dash was like, what, 17 years old? How old was Dash when he died? Like, much older than we expected. And uh, during his later years, he uh, experienced some incontinence that we now have to fix before we get a new cat that I've <laughs> describe that earlier and i guess uh that that's your christmas your christmas story and I, we're going to perform a christmas miracle or a hanukkah miracle or kwanzaa or whatever you celebrate and we're gonna clean the rooms that uh, have been uh, destroyed by pets and probably sometime in the next few months maybe by mid-march maybe well i think that might be like mid-march might be the time when we will have a new kitten and that's something to look forward to in 2023 and then the next thing to look forward to in 2023 unless i have some reason to make this anti-semitism video or some other video is that on uh, january 2nd 2023 i will be back with my next media mix-up i hope to see as many of you there who as who can attend uh, I'm not sure whether it will be at like 3 or 4 or 5 p.m. Pacific. It depends on the other types of meetings I have to work around and what's going on that day. But I appreciate those of you who are able to show up. I appreciate my recorded show viewers. And until next time, I guess I will be... Oh, Happy New Year to everyone. And I'll see you all in the new year. And until then, I guess I'll be seeing all of you around the Internet.